Um, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for being on here today. We are very excited to be partnering with Tamarack on, uh, on today's webinar, as we have on a number of webinars um, over the last little while, and, and there will be some more in the future. So I'm just super excited to be here and to see uh, all of the people that are we're on here. I'm just going to take a couple minutes. While this is about community engagement, I do want to take a couple minutes just to tell you about about us, um, and then and then to give you more information about how you can find us because this is really the two minute overview of of Trillium. So, um, as you can see on your screen, who we are, who are we, and what we do. We are an agency of the government of Ontario. Um, we are the largest uh, grant making foundation in uh, Canada uh, with a budget of over $136 million and every year uh, we award uh, grants to, uh, to more than a thousand projects across a whole spectrum of things that we do, a number of programs, a number of investment streams that we invest in. And um, we also, um, we kind of, we do the investment, but we also do some knowledge management and other things uh, that kind of center us as a, as a leading public agency of the provincial government and a partner with you in the, in the public benefit sector. That's the way we like to think of ourselves as, as your partner, uh, not just as a funder. That's who we are. So if we can go to the next one. And very quickly, um, what do we fund? There, we have a number of mechanisms, a number of programs, a number of investment streams and ways that, we, um, that you can access funds. But for the purpose of today, we're not going to get into that. I just want to talk about what we fund. Um, and, and what you're looking at are, are what we call our action areas. And they define what we mean by healthy and vibrant communities. That's our mission. Our mission is to help build healthy and vibrant communities by investing in, in you guys to, uh, to accomplish a whole um, number of things. I'm not going to go through one by one each one of these things, but as you can see, we break them up into six areas. Active people, connected people, green people, inspired people, promising young people, and prosperous people. And each one of those things, as you can see in the colorful kind of taglines underneath, describes what it is that we want to invest in um, to accomplish things in community. Um, and that, importantly, like I say, that's that's the what, and there are a number of mechanisms for how. We can move on to the next. And uh, finally, the last thing I'm going to say is, uh, as I said, that is really just scratching the surface of what it is that we do at Trillium. If you are interested in learning more about Trillium, please contact us. Number one, go to our website. It is very good. Our communication team has done a fantastic job, and you can find out everything it is that we do how to access us, how to access funds through the different investment streams and action areas on our website, and certainly follow up with our support center at the numbers listed there or our email at otf.ca, at OTF and they can, uh, our support center can direct you to um, specific staff that can work with you on your idea and help you figure out how best to penetrate our uh, very large investment model. And that's a uh, that's a brief intro into Trillium, and I'm going to pass it um, pass it back to Megan. Thanks, Doug. So now it's my uh, pleasure to introduce you to our webinar speaker for today, Sylvia Chu. Sylvia is a consulting director of the Tamarack Institute's Community Engagement Idea Area. She is passionate about community change and what becomes possible when residents and various sector leaders share an aspirational vision for their future. Sylvia believes that when the assets of residents and community are recognized and connected, they become powerful drivers of community change. Sylvia is an internationally recognized community builder and trainer. Over the last five years, much of Sylvia's work has focused on building awareness and capacity in the areas of collective impact and community engagement throughout North America. So we give you a big welcome, Sylvia, and I'll hand it off to you. Thanks so much, Meg. Nice to hear your voice too, Doug. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, so from my perspective, I'm going to try and see if, uh, can I advance the slides? I, oh, I think you may need to do that for me, if that's okay, Meg. Um, uh, you should have, slide. sorry, Sylvia, you should have access. I should. Um, it's not letting me at the moment. So maybe if you don't okay. mind, that would be great. Yeah, yeah. okay. So just to go on to the next slide, I think from my perspective in this one hour, what is it we want to try and do? This is my agenda, but I'm also going to next give you a chance to chime in in terms of what brought you here, what questions you hold, and then we can adapt this a little bit. So the first is really wanting to deepen our understanding of community engagement as an essential piece of any community change effort. 
um, I really want to make sure that we just introduce and profile to you just two of the many tools that we at Tamarack utilize and share around how to begin to ensure that you are um, effectively engaging your community. And then lastly, just want to have some time to explore folks, your questions, your insights even, um, around strengthening uh, our collective practice and community engagement. So that's your cue that um, as we go through this, if you can jot down observations and in experiences to share and or questions you're holding, that will be really helpful to all of us. On to the next. So that is the segue for me. Um, really, if I can invite you to add to our chat box that we can all see what for you are the big challenges or questions that you have about community engagement. Um, what is it that drew you here today? Trying to see. So Sylvia, we've got a couple of responses. So we have somebody saying reaching Beautiful. people beyond the, down, beyond the downtown core, um, very divided community. How do we get different groups and sectors to be more open to working together? Creating authentic relationships, reaching new audiences, managing engagements, how to develop trust with communities who have historically had reason not to trust institutions, what strategies work and what don't. And there's lots and lots of other here. Some are around um, geography, rural versus urban. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's lots of great questions coming. Beautiful, that's great. And it's great to have them all kind of identified here and we'll kind of work our way through. But then if new ones emerge or if other questions, um, if you're, you know, I'm not getting to the nugget of it for you, would love some ongoing clarification. So if we can go to the next slide. So it's interesting. We would love to do a poll then, just to let you have a better sense of the other folks on the line. If you had to pick what for you is the biggest challenge around community engagement, um, lack of resources, lack of knowledge or capacity, the broad geography, which we've already heard, diverse audiences, and engaging community partners. If you had to pick one as the biggest priority, go ahead and do that and then we'll get to see collectively where we're at in terms of our curiosity. And this is where I rely on your magic, Megan. Yeah, so we see the results. We've had almost 76% of the crowd respond, which is awesome, and people are continuing to, to put in their um, two cents. So right now, um, we're seeing a split between lack of resources and diverse audiences to engage, with um, engaging community partners being sort of the third most common. Beautiful, 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 beautiful. Okay, that's really helpful. So it is about this diversity um, how, specifically around uh, and resourcing this effectively and engaging community partners. So let's dig into the meat of what this is and see if we can come out the other end with a bit of clarity. Um, looking at the research, um, if we flip to the next slide, these are um, some of the common, common challenges that people name when they start talking about and thinking about how would they go about doing some engagement. Um, when I think about this versus some of the questions we've got, I mean, it's interesting to see that some of these are related to internal organizational engagement and creating alignment in within an organization as much as engaging outside the organization for um, different communities. Um, and I think someone had named this, you know, part of the challenge sometimes about engaging community or engaging particular diverse audiences is this piece where, you know, we have to own that there's been a track record that may have preceded us where, you know, we have come to community in a very transactional way um, to get information that we need that will serve us. And they are, you know, um, skeptical 
about uh, the authenticity of our consideration, our commitment to this. And so, you know, helpful to remember and to know that it might take us a little, more than one kick of the can to get to this hope that we are um, around engagement. So if we can go to the next one. I totally love this continuum. Comes from um, IAP2, the public participation spectrum. Why I like this as a frame is it really helps us to see how important it is before we even go out and begin to engage to get clarity and consensus amongst ourselves about what is the purpose, what is the intent um, that we want to accomplish with our engagement, and that there are actually a range of options. Here are sort of along a continuum, the five big ones. So sometimes we just want to inform people about what's happening. Um, Sometimes we want to consult with people. So, you know, we've come up with three possible solutions. We need to hear from you. Which one do you think is the best? Sometimes we're starting a little bit beyond, you know, a little bit sooner than that and wanting to name or get validation. Here's a problem that we're seeing. You know, what's your thinking about this? What ideas do you have about how it might be addressed? Collaboration is, you know what, we need to work together to solve this problem. Let's, you know, how do we want to do this? What does this look like? And then the empower is, you folks seem to care about this issue and really are leading out on it. How can we support you to continue to do your work and do your work better or with greater impact? All of these are legitimate um, forms of engagement where a lot of the mistrust or um, around engagement can sometimes come from is if we who are doing the engaging aren't clear about what our intent is or there's a disconnect between you know the tools we're using the approaches we're using and our intention around really engaging or involving but we're using sort of um, approaches that are really kind of transactional and about information if we go to the next slide Are you there, Meg? Ah, there we go. Um, you know, many of you who've been doing work with us around the collective impact work absolutely know and are familiar with different types of problems. Simple ones where we have a known recipe and it's really about implementing or executing that in our jurisdiction. Complicated where there are a number of moving parts that we have to click together, but we're confident once we put them together, it's going to work. And complex, which are problems that we are trying to solve um, that are dynamic. So they're not easy to pin down. There's a lot of interconnected contributing factors. Um, the dynamic of the community we're serving is shifting and changing on an ongoing basis. Naturally, it's a different kind of problem and some of the tools and uh, resources that we bring to it need to look different. And in keeping with that, if we go to the next slide, and we anchor ourselves right back into this continuum, two things I want to note. So if you think about simple problems and complicated problems, you know, informing and, in, uh, and consulting often are, you know, areas where that's the level of engagement sometimes needed. Where we're moving into the dynamic, more um, hard to pin down issues and challenges, those are the places where on the continuum perhaps a more um, mutually co-created um, solution will be a stronger, more effective one, and therefore it would sort of suggest that we need to be on more of the right-hand side of that continuum, so more involvement, more collaboration, more empowering. One, I just want to reiterate again, one of the um, issues that you need to think about are things like, um, you know, what is your intent? What do you need? And one level is no better than the other. It's all about, you know, what kind of issue do you have and what do you want to have accomplished through it? Okay, can we go to the next one? So the next slide, which is um, looking a bit strange to me anyway, um, is all about why it's so critical to um, set the right kind of expectations. So often, you know, some of this stuff fails because we've chosen the wrong level of community to, uh, to engage. Um, 
as you know, there's cynicism and we haven't maybe left enough time to overcome that cynicism and build the trust to get the kind of participation we're hoping for. Um, you know, the community really wants to be involved in co-creating a solution. And we think it's our job to come with an answer and give them a choice of A, B, or C. Um, sometimes, um, you know, we have to, if we're going to design an authentic process, um, really pay attention to the techniques, the methodologies that we're using, and do they actually take us to the level of engagement that we're hoping to achieve? Implementation, some of the big challenges there are around, you know, great intent, but our facilitation and execution of it is a bit weaker. Um, the way we do it, because we haven't left enough time or enough opportunity, people don't feel heard, or there's such a power imbalance that, you know, people are afraid to speak their truth and have it be received and heard with an open mind and curiosity. Okay, on to the next one. The whole thought of community engagement, the, the whole practice of it um, is evolving itself and getting richer and more robust in how we think about it. Um, there are five sort of core elements that are sort of newer and challenging what many of us might see as the more dominant, more familiar approaches to uh, community engagement. So one is, it's not solely uh, the realm of community engagement to just be about in information exchange. Now, increasingly, Community engagement is used as an ongoing practice within organizations with the goal to building a diversity of relationships within the community with different stakeholder groups and different perspectives. A second element that's also being integrated in is education. And for me, effective community engagement actually is bi-directional um, education or, you know, so in the spirit of kind of power sharing, the information exchange is equally flowing both ways. And there's an openness and curiosity for both to hear from each other. Uh, a, a third piece is really moving further along because we tackle often now many more complex issues and opportunities. How do we share ownership for um, the, uh, the issue, the challenge, and coming up with the solution? Integration is really about what are the channels we're using for um, for community engagement and are we kind of integrating and making best use of the right kinds of channels and vehicles um, for the audiences that we're hoping to reach and the, the final one and I'll talk a little bit more about this as well is that there are different kinds of expertise we need at the table. So let's unpack each one of these a little bit. So building relationships increasingly what we are seeing is that Sometimes people are engaging not with a particular answer to a particular initiative or whatever, but really more about increasing knowledge bi-directionally, as I'd said, really to look at and with a lens to what's already going on in the com community and how can we in our role, who care about a particular issue, empower and support local groups that are already doing great work in this instead of just assuming it's our job to deliver it. And the another big reason that community engagement is showing up is that communities overall get stronger and better able to respond to both opportunities and challenges when they are better connected. So the value of connecting different perspectives together um, is important in and of itself. Come to the next one. This next slide that's coming, this is actually taken from an incredibly good resource that I would highly recommend from a group out of Australia called Kupire. And I think for me, this sort of articulates the piece that we just talked about. So yes, we might be engaging to inform decisions. Sometimes we might be engaging to build capacity, both internally to our organization but and, and or uh, to our stakeholder partners and or to the community at large. And the third piece is around uh, strengthening relationships and often what you'll see if you would try to locate your intent it might be somewhere in the middle um, between these different pieces um, and what I particularly love if you want to find and download the resources health and we'll share the link of course 
is that they've actually um, identified a range of engagement tools and which tools seem to best deliver on any one, you know, each one of these three kind of intents for community engagement. Next one. Um, if what your intent really is, is around building relationships, then some of the things you need to be thinking about in terms of how you design are things like how do you create a, an agenda that's flexible enough um, that allows time for story sharing, for people to get to know each other on multiple levels, for really good listening and curiosity questioning, um, particularly when it's groups that wouldn't normally interact with each other. Um, and acknowledging that we are engaging for the sole purpose of building relationship might be an important thing to kind of put out there right at the beginning, because rarely does that happen. It's usually because there's an end product that we're needing to get to, and people will probably expect that when you first approach them. So just building relationship as, um, as an intent and a valuable purpose um, is something that's a bit newer and that you might need to sort of be clear about if that's your expectation. Next one, I'm sure it's on the way. So education, information, it really is about the stronger community is the community that's really well informed. And so how do we create those opportunities for mutual uh, education across uh, stakeholders who wouldn't normally interact with each other? It's often what we find is an important source of creativity and innovation when you bring diverse partnerships together. Okay, next one. Uh, this is really interesting. Um, you know, when we're talking about, you know, building relationships and educating, an important consideration is people come to issues with different levels of knowledge and information, and there's a direct correlation, somewhat varied, but across, you know, Australia, Canada, UK, US, around the degree to which it, a group is informed and their subsequent level of trust in the organization. So when I look at this, I mean, it does paint a challenge, but it also helps to validate for me why having an intention of community engagement for the sole purpose of educating um, actually has some legitimacy to it, right? If we make sure that our stakeholders are better informed, both about our issues and what we're seeing, odds are they're more likely to trust us and then more likely to come to us when they see things that are emerging. Okay, next one. For me, this is an interesting snapshot, which is talking at, looking at the millennials versus folks 36 and over, and look at the differences in terms of where these age groups turn to get their, um, their information. The blue box is Facebook, but for me, that's broader. It's actually social media, generally speaking, uh, TV, news websites, word of mouth, you know, so this might be really informative for you depending on if there's a particular age audience you want to be reaching. Are you using the right channels to reach them? If you're trying to kind of get all age groups, then, you know, you really need to be mindful about using an array of different approaches to speak to the listening of these different audiences. So useful to think about. also kind of highlights some of the intentionality you need to bring to designing an effective community engagement process. Love this slide, I have to say. And what it's kind of reminding us is, you know, remember that the environment that you're putting your messaging out into is a very cluttered space, a very noisy space, and that there will be lots of competition for grabbing people's attention and, you know, hooking them in a bit deeper, things that folks have found really effective, knowing that that's the context that we're moving this work into is, can you use video? Can you use infographics that people can look at in a split second and get a good feel or a sense of what it is you're trying to um, frame for them? Humor, people tend to remember that. Um, 
really making sure that you know you're being clear about what's in this for you why this is important for you as opposed to why is this important for me um, and making sure you're accessing the channels you need and then how do you kind of give people permission or opportunities to kind of do their bit to help spread the message along for you all right next one La, um, for me, this is a really important distinction. And again, I'm thinking you're moving, you know, depending on and assuming where you are at on the continuum of engagement is more towards, you know, ser shared solution making. Um, really kind of setting the stage appropriately for what it is you're wanting. If what you are hoping to do is get buy-in, having people validate and or slightly refine ideas that you've already kind of developed and sort of you know, pressure test them, then it, you know, buy in is sufficient. Um, but if what you're really, un, you're unsure or you're innovating or, um, you know, you want to try and come up with a new approach to something, having that process and uh, be shared in terms of its ownership is probably the stronger bias that you need to be leading towards. Um, and so that really helps you to determine and or affirm kind of the tools and the approaches you need to be integrating explicitly into your engagement process. Go on to the next one. Um, okay, so the next one for me is something we've already talked about. So it's really kind of just anchoring back to that first kind of continuum and uh, the buy-in and the ownership. Okay, and if we go to the next one, what we're talking about here is how do you begin to integrate um, the messaging that you have. So you can integrate your different communications channels. What are the messaging pieces that we have and how do we best position or deliver those in a variety of channels? How do we need to shift it up so it's you know appropriate for that channel? How do we, in every opportunity that we have to do outreach, um, integrate opportunities for feedback? Um, and ultimately, remembering as well that most community engagement efforts, if they fall down, are about we haven't intentionally thought about how we synthesize and then share back to our contributors what it is that A, we have gleaned from the information that they and others have shared with us, and as importantly, what are we going to do with it? And finally, you know, in the spirit of building relationship, you also want to be making sure that regardless of um, sort of what you're reaching out out to folks about how can you continue to empower them to help deliver your message and become some of those word of mouth channels that we rely on so heavily. Next one is really about reminding us that we need, particularly when we are trying to design around a complex issue where we can honestly say we don't have the answer or set of answers we need to make a difference on the issue. We need to be very intentional about welcoming to the table both our content expertise and our context expertise. So what do we mean by that? Really what it is, is content experts are the subject matter experts around a topic that it's important to bring together and invite to think together. The context experts are equally important. These are the folks with lived experience. These are the residents of a particular community because what they have and the knowledge that they bring, which is equally essential to that of the content experts, is that they know how to make um, a good idea that in theory, real and effective on the ground in your unique community. So you might see this brilliant strategy, opportunity, solution coming out of, I don't know, Pennsylvania. So if that's kind of, but that doesn't necessarily mean when you bring it to downtown Toronto, it's going to work. So the, the piece that we need to think about is who are those experts who can really tell us what's going to work in this particular neighborhood and what won't, or with, with this particular audience of people or other. So can we lead to the next one, which is the con so we've kind of gone over a bit of a theoretical piece, and now what I want to do is just 
briefly, briefly introduce to you a couple of tools um, that um, we want to touch on. Um, I'm jumping ahead a little bit though, so you can see how you would go about in this next slide, how you engage those different types of experts. So let's go to the tools. So this is like how you would take this theory and maybe start to practice it. The first one is the empathy map. I find that this is a tool that can be really effective on your internal team if you're trying to design a community engagement initiative or strategy and you know you have to speak to the listening of different audiences. It can also be a really useful and helpful tool if you're bringing together diverse groups with varying experience and you want them to really understand that you are also trying to engage and work with and need to work with other players who have a different set of needs around the same issue. How it works is this. Um, you can bring groups together and ask each one to intentionally hold a different perspective. So in this case, we're making it up. So we're going to do a community engagement effort. And we want to think about how do we want this effort to feel, to do, you know, uh, for a community resident. When they hear about our initiative, what we're trying to do, what are they feeling? What will we hope that they're doing? What are they saying about it? What are they seeing? What are they thinking? And what are they hearing? When you walk all the way through, particularly if you do it in a small group with multiple perspectives, you'll have a rich sense of all of that. And then what you need to do is, okay, so knowing that, as we think about how we might communicate out around our issue to community residents, what do we think the top three things are that they would hope to glean from our effort? And what might they see as the top three challenges that would get in the way of them getting what they want? Similarly, you would hold, you know, maybe it's a funder or as organizational leaders, when you hear about an initiative like this, what are you doing? What are you seeing? What are you saying, thinking, feeling, going around, doing the same process, and then thinking about if we're working collaboratively as our network of collaborators, what is it that we need to get from this process and use, uh, you know, really debrief that and help ourselves hold different perspectives and then really think about so what would success look like for us then knowing that you know there are multiple needs and expectations around this process and being sensitive to addressing those sometimes for example it'd be really useful if you're a funder to um you know or if community residents have ideas about funders make them be the funder or, you know, or the organizational leader. Make the organizational leaders imagine that they're resident in this particular community and really have them think about it from the other person's shoes. It will help you build a much more robust and realistic strategy and help you also tease out the nuances of messaging and or vehicles to reach these diverse audiences. So that's tool number one. Tool number two, this, I'm sure, this continuum is starting to look familiar, and this is actually the photo underneath, actually comes from a project we actually did with a bunch of community workers in a neighborhood, and they wanted to deepen um, their relationship with the residents that they were working with in their neighborhood. And so we really kind of sat with them as a group and asked them to name where did they think they were now in terms of the dominant way in which they work to engage the residents of the community. And given sort of the work that they wanted to accomplish over the next two years, what level of engagement did they think they needed to move toward? Um, what was lovely about this was we could have then, once this was up and transparent for the team as a whole to see, a really rich conversation about even within sort of the where we are now, slight variances, what do we think that's about? What are we doing really well here? Where has this served us well? Where has it failed us, our approach to engagement to date? And given what we want to accomplish in partnership with the community residents where we are, what level of, of engagement do we need to move to? And then having some rich conversations about why there might be, again, some variants. In this case, because I was there and we worked on it together, there were some people, the ones who were all around the empower dimension, were folks that were aspirational. 
this is ultimately where we want to get to in two years. And the folks that were down more around collaboration were, yes, we want, but we want to undercommit and over deliver. So realistically, even though, yeah, we share that aspiration, realistically, where we think we can get in two years is collaboration. And that would be huge in and of itself. So having that dialogue was really useful to build consensus across the team around how they move forward. So that would be our second tool. And then at the last slide, what we've got here, and I just wanted um, you to see it, is to say, you know, once you've kind of explored this from a multiple set of angles, really being intentional about and writing down amongst yourself, what is our purpose for engaging people? Who are the audience or audiences we want? If, and I, some of you ask questions about, well, what if we don't have those relationships with the community? Maybe there are um, other agencies that you know in the community that do have strong relationships. Can you lean in on them and ask them to help you? Um, being really clear about the outcomes you're trying to achieve with the engagement. Is this a one-off or is this the beginning of building a long-term relationship uh, to the community? Um, and also recognizing that engagement, often we're really good at remembering to do it at the startup of something, but have we intentionally planned for ongoing engagement throughout the lifespan of uh, an initiative? That's an important consideration to have. And then the resourcing, you know, I think, you know, a number of you ask questions about how the heck do you resource this? Well, you know, maybe it begins with being really intentional about um, adding costs to um, at responsibly adding to a budget of a project um, a more robust um, communications kind of budget. Um, but the other piece is, you know, are there resources, skills in your volunteer network um, that you can draw upon if you don't have sort of cash resources in the moment? How do you begin? What are some of the creative solutions that you can draw upon to leverage? Um, are your intention around communication. So I'm going to pause there and kind of draw things to a close other than to say now is the chance where um, I would love to invite you if there were insights, if there were learnings you've had and in terms of effective engagement, painful lessons you learned the hard way that you'd be willing to share, or you know, continued questions around the topic in general or any of the specifics that we worked through this morning, I'd love to hear them. So to kick us off, Sylvia, we've had lots of great questions coming in throughout the call. Um, and so one major theme that we keep seeing is definitely around this diversity piece. Um, and so there's been some questions around, you know, how do you engage different groups and sectors to be more open to working together? Um, but there's also questions around the diversity within communities and how you kind of bring together peoples with different ages and interests and professional levels. Um, so do you have any comments on sort of the diversity piece of bringing these diverse groups together to work on an issue that might be interesting to them? Yeah. I would say a couple things. I would say first and foremost, you know, making sure that it is, um, you know, do we really need, question, do we really need to bring together a diverse group of audiences? Or, you know, for what we're trying to accomplish, is it better for us to kind of go deep with a narrower subset? Um, that would be one thing. Uh, diversity as well. Sometimes if there's not trust, even between different groups, it might be useful and helpful to meet uh, or engage individually with different perspectives first um, and really create individual relationships of trust with different perspectives. And then um, before you try and bring everyone together all in the same room, because what you'll find in any grouping is that there are people who are more curious and or willing uh, or in a place where they're able to kind of interact and have some of their viewpoints and stereotypes about them challenged. And other people, just from where they are, are, you know, more fragile about that, less willing to kind of explore how we would bridge this and, you know, and use that discernment. You don't have to get everybody all at once, but are there a handful 
of folks from each one of the diverse communities that you can all bring together and say, how do we create a reality? What are the barriers that are getting in the way of these different groups talking to each other? If we were to invite them, would they come? What's one unifying thing that might that they might all have in common? So they have a reason to interact with each other and therefore might discover, in spite of what some of their assumptions are, that they actually have very similar aspirations or hopes around a key issue. So, you know, just being really clear, who are those groups? If you don't know what their needs are or what their hesitations are, making sure you take the time to ask and determine that with a bit more clarity before you jump into actually starting to engage them. And then, you know, have a couple of folks from these diverse audiences become, you know, safe sounding boards for you. If, you know, you on behalf of your organization are dipping your toe into engagement for the first time. You know, you don't have to do this alone. So, and people generally, if you ask them honestly and they have a sense they want to hear, you, you want to listen, they will tell you. Beautiful. And I think this sort of speaks to some of the answers that you just touched upon, but there are a couple of questions around that trust piece. Um, and specifically when historically there's been a, um, a you know, trust has been broken and you're trying to sort of rebuild that trust. Um, so how mm. to develop trust with communities who have historically had reason not to trust those institutions? I would say two things. I would say rather than hosting an event that you again expect the community to come to, educate yourself first about where are those meeting places in the community, where are the meetings that are already happening? Can you, before you even go out and be asking people, spend some time listening to them, spend some time understanding what it is that their hopes and aspirations are, and then think about how you might, you know, how what you're trying to accomplish as an organization may align with some of the hopes that these neighbors have. It would also then give you an opportunity to see where the assets are, Never do we walk into a community and there's a blank slate that we're working from. Um, so can we become, can we educate ourselves about who, you know, who the agency resources are, who the leaders, the natural leaders are of those communities, um, and what matters to them? How do we position what we're trying to do in a way that aligns with what they want to accomplish instead of the other way around? That would be a first piece. Um, and then I think for me, it's also just being honest and straight up about we know there's not enough trust. So in our engagement planning, give ourselves lots and lots and lots of time. Um, if we are engaging around a specific project, we would ask ourselves, what if we thought that this engagement around this project is the start of intentionally building longer term relationships with the community? Um, how would we, you know, how would we continue to engage? How would we continue to inform? That would be another way. And then lastly, I think sometimes the best way to get people to come forward and give things to you is to start by giving to them. So what is it that we can just genuinely offer from our strength, from our knowledge, from our resources that we think the community might be interested in? And just give that, first and foremost, with no expectation. Because um, over time, if we continue to be there and we continue to be present and we continue to keep showing up, we stop becoming the emissary from the agency and we start becoming, oh, that guy that I met or that guy that's always coming out to the meetings. Um, he must really care. She must really, you know, she must really um, be part of this community or want to be part of this community. And that can go a long way. Great. So it, I guess it begins with that acknowledging, yeah, we do have to build trust. Also think about yourself. What would it take if someone's really burned you? What kinds of things would work for you in terms of want, rebuilding trust? That's a great tip. Um, another question here is, do you have any advice on how, helping to bridge the gap between an intergenerational um, group of people? So specifically between millennials and baby boomers? Um, it's interesting because I saw this really lovely project um, 
where it was actually grade five students talking to seniors. And they kind of built relationship over time. I think um, when we can become an us, we get a lot farther than when we are an us and them, as opposed to a we. And so almost always, um, there are interests or passions or hopes that we share that transcend us all. So how do we, knowing that part of this has to be about relationship and creating shared understanding, how do we make sure that if we're the host of this, uh, this engagement effort, that we're actually giving lots of time um, to having you know, one or two real questions about people getting to know each other um, and getting to talk about what they care about, getting to talk about what they're afraid of, those kinds of things, without necessarily needing to leap into action right away. Um, because they need to understand where each other's coming from. Um, sometimes it's about, you know, when you think about talking to this other group that you don't talk to, you know, what are some of the things that you anticipate they're going to say? What are some of the things you would be looking to them from? And then kind of, you know, be the emissary. Oh, you know, this group, they really think these things about you. Is that true? Is this not true? How would you say it? Um, so they get to learn about each other through you if they're not necessarily willing to meet with each other right away. Great, and I think we have time for one more, and we've seen lots of questions um, around sort of the issue of capacity. So, um, you know, how do you maximize results trying to be mindful of people's time um, and also sort of wearing how to manage your own energy if you're doing this as a volunteer? So just sort of that capacity piece. Um, I think, um, you know, scope creep is always such an issue. So I think really getting grounded in what's our intent, first and foremost. Do we really need to go uh, full out or is this really just a simple information exchange? That would be one thing. Um, I would think about once you kind of get that plan, look at the resources that you do have. Where can you lean in? Do you have strong partnerships where they might have resources that you can piggyback on as opposed to thinking you have to do it all yourself? You know, if, for example, if you're trying to reach kids and, you know, you're a very small fledgling nonprofit, but you know how you have a good relationship with five of the local school councils, can you kind of lean in on them and speak to them and get them to utilize their channels to help deliver your messaging for you and with you. Being willing to think outside the box a little bit. And probably many short hits are better than thinking people are going to be interested and willing to spend 15, 20 minutes on maybe answering your survey. And then the last one I heard was, you know, be opportunistic. You know, for youth, you know, if what they really want is an iPad, how do you get, you know, it, as part of your, you know, weekend focus group with these folks, how do you raffle off an iPad? How do you serve food? Um, you know, different pe people come for different reasons. So how do you make it fun for them? How do you give them something um, that benefits them while you're accomplishing what you need to? So create magnets that draw them to you instead of always feeling like you have to pull them along. Great, thank you so much, Sylvia. This has been such a great presentation and those uh, questions and answers were so thoughtful and we really appreciate that. Um, as and I'm loving how engaged people have been, so I really appreciate that as well. Yeah, it's made for a great question and answer period. Um, so in a few days, as we promised, we'll be sending out the recording of this web webinar along to all the registrants today, um, as along with any resources that were mentioned. We also have some incredible learning opportunities that are just around the corner that I'd love to share with you and I think would be right up your alley. Uh, we are hosting our annual Collective Impact 3.0 workshop, a three-day gathering that will explore the latest in the practice of collective impact from experts, practitioners, and early adopters of the work. This workshop is about a month away, so don't hesitate to sign up for that if you are currently working on a collective impact initiative. And as a reminder, special rates are available for Ontario, Ontario Trillium Foundation grantees. So you, uh, if you are one of those people and you're interested in attending, please reach out to us and we can help you with a special price. 
Um, also, in April, we are hosting a workshop in Kitchener, Ontario, all about asset-based community development with a focus on neighborhood development and community health. Uh, this will be a rare opportunity to learn from Cormac Russell and John McKnight, two of the world's top trainers in asset-based community development. Registration links for both these events will be shared in the email you receive after today's webinar, along with links to sign up for the next installment of this transformative action webinar series. So to learn more about upcoming learning opportunities, including workshops and free webinars like this one, visit us at www.tamarackcommunity.ca. We also encourage you to take a minute to complete a short webinar so survey to offer feedback on how you enjoyed today's call. The link is on your screen and will also be sent mm -hmm. out uh, through email as well. So thanks again, everybody, and have a great day. Thanks, Megan. Bye, everyone.